delicious people. This is <laughs> such a thrill to be here. Thank you, Eloise, for having me. I feel very honoured to be in this space and sharing my heart and soul with, with all of you and what I'm all about. So tonight is all about Are We Going Mad? And my take on it, my version of that is rushing woman syndrome. So tonight you're going to learn some science and different ways that the body works, but we're also going to talk a lot about psychology and beliefs and emotions that drive our behaviours. I think everyone needs a mission. Everyone needs something in their heart that really inspires them. And mine is not just to educate people, because if all I do is share knowledge with you and information, it might make sense to you and it might ring true for you, but that doesn't necessarily really prompt you to follow through because I pose this question tonight to you very early why do you do what you do when you know what you know yeah. it's a really good thing to think about so with edu it's not a lack of education that leads someone to polish off a packet of chocolate biscuits after dinner, for example. That's not a lack of knowledge. There's no one in this room who thinks that they're doing themselves any favour by eating in that way. It's usually emotional. So what I find is that a whole lot of education, yeah, that's great, but when you couple it with inspiration, it tends to stick more. A whole lot of inspiration is a whole lot of rah-rah, that doesn't stick either. So my mission is to educate and inspire people improving their health and happiness because probably you've all noticed that when we feel happier, we tend to take much better care of ourselves than when we're sad or feeling lonely. And then through that process, create a ripple effect that transforms the world. I had an experience tonight with a rushing man. He asked me to mention him. He was my very kind taxi driver. And we were caught in horrific traffic getting here. And I said to him completely calmly, it's actually really important that I get there on time. So he was doing extraordinary manoeuvres and he was throwing, he was French, and he's throwing his hands around in an extraordinary way. And he's, as he's driving and throwing his hands around, he's saying to me, what do you do? And I, was, I laughed my head off. I said, I've just written a book called Rushing Woman Syndrome. I'm going to talk about it tonight. And I could have become, my choice was to become irate that there was traffic, but there was nothing I could do about it. He was doing his absolute best, and we ended up having the most delicious, soul-nourishing conversation between my hotel and here, and he's gone off happy as a duck, just, oh dear. <laughs> he's gone off as happy as a duck. And my point is that when we are amped up on too many stimulants, so when we have bucket loads of caffeine and lots of processed food that's devoid of nutrients, all our cells don't work properly, and it's very difficult even for someone with a beautiful, kind heart, it's very difficult to be patient and kind when you're so worked up biochemically from all those stimulants. And when we treat the people we love the most in the world with impatience or a lack of kindness, even for a split second because of what's going on for us, that then influences how they then go out and interact with the world. So I believe and what I observe every day of my life is that when we take responsibility and do all we can to demonstrate kindness to others that really genuinely literally has a ripple effect that makes such a massive difference in the world each and every one of us so, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so tonight I want to share with you this concept gents the all of the processes still go on in your body except the ovary ones <laughs> you can virtually relate it to your testes however the psychology <laughs> they're similar the psychology, however, is very feminine. So for the, psych the psychology part, please open your mind and your heart and be prepared to learn a lot about the delicious ladies in your life who you care about. So I'll cover all those juicy bits and give you, I hope, some uh, really inspiring things to think about. When I wrote, first came up with the concept, I actually came up with the concept when I wrote my first book, Accidentally Overweight. I just, it came out of me, I just wrote Rushing Woman Syndrome and I thought, that's my next book. So here it is. And because I thought it might be difficult for people to work out if they have it, because I meet countless women who I can feel the vibration of them. If I could make a noise to describe them, it's they're functioning like that, they may not display it outwardly. They can put the, the calm exterior can be held as a few in the room with uh, acknowledging it with giggles. But we can display such a calm exterior when on the inside we're wound up like a top. And I can say to people, do you feel stressed? And they'll say no, but it's because they're so used to it and they've become very capable on the outside of dealing with it. 
If we put a frog, I would never do this, but if we were to put a frog, because I love frogs, it's one of my nicknames, embarrassingly, if we put a frog into cold water, it would swim around. If we put a frog into boiling water, it would jump out. If you put a frog into cool water and start to heat it up from down below, he won't notice. And he will eventually keep swimming, but then he'll die from the heat. And that's really what we're doing to ourselves in our lives. We are just slowly cooking ourselves. And it takes for us to pause before we notice that maybe this isn't all okay and maybe this isn't what we really need to do. So I came up with a test that you're very welcome to go and take at rushingwomansyndrome.com and have a great giggle. A rushing woman loves her coffee to the point that she feels deprived if she cannot get her daily fix. I am not exaggerating when I say to you that I've had women literally have tantrums in my office. Truly, they cry and stomp their feet when I've asked them just to cut back, not even to go without it, just to cut back. It's so pow that addiction is so powerful. But it's more than just the drink. When a man shows up for a one-on-one -on -one consultation with me, for example, he's already made a decision that he's going to act on whatever me as an expert suggests that he do, that he do in his life. So when I say to a man, it'd be great if you cut back and just have one coffee in your day, he goes, sure, no problem. But women go, really? It's the only thing that gives me pleasure in my day. And we've got these incredible stories about what it means to us. She often answers so busy or stressed when someone asks her how she is. I was raised to say, well, thank you. And when I noticed so busy coming out of my mouth, I went, oh, things have got to change. She often has pens uh, painful menstrual periods or terrible PMS or a debilitating menopause. She could demolish anything or anyone in her path leading up to menstruation. She craves sugar, particularly mid-afternoon or close to menstruation. A rushing woman tends to feel overwhelmed often and she can feel a sense of anxiety and panic easily. You can feel like your heart is racing even when you're sitting still and you constantly feel like you're running on adrenaline. It doesn't seem to matter if we have two things on our to-do list or 200. We show up in life. Our presence in life is with the attitude of, oh my goodness, I've got so much to do. And if you believe that there's not enough hours in the day, there won't be. Because you only ever see evidence of how your beliefs are true. You don't ever see the 60 million thousand examples of how that's not true. Your reticular activating system at the base of your brain is primed to help you find evidence for what you believe to be true. The challenge is that most of us don't even know what we believe. Most of us absorbed a set of beliefs before we were old enough to talk. And sometimes we've absorbed those beliefs from people that we may not even ask for street directions from today. And the trouble is that a lot of us don't even know what we believe until conflict or anxiety or even health challenges, relationship challenges begin to bubble their way to the surface in our lives. I pose this question to you, what if everything, everything was a gift? What if everything was a gift? If you had that belief, if that was how you lived your life, instead of the belief that there's not enough time, that there's not enough hours in the day, you would show up quite differently just with that simple shift. Many women feel very tired, but yet they're wired. So they'll describe an exhaustion, an exhaustion to me. They're tired in their bones. Their, their body feels heavy and laden, but their brain just can't stop and it's forever churning over. She will often feel like there aren't enough hours in the day while trying to achieve as much as possible. She will check her emails in the bathroom, at traffic lights, or late at night. When did it become normal to take a cell phone to the toilet? <laughs> and you hear people, you hear the click, click, click of the cell phones as people are texting while they sit on the toilet. And that, it, it, it's common, but it's not potentially normal. And I, and I find as well, when you, if you do this experiment, next time you stop at a red traffic light, in the past, I think we used to look around. So you would look at the person maybe in the car opposite you and you know how you can feel it when the person in the car beside you is looking at you? So they go like that and then you pretend you haven't looked at them. Or you would have noticed the sky or the autumn leaves or you might have focused on, you might have thought about how much you love your mum. So we tended to pause and think and observe. Or you were listening to a song on the radio that was hopefully uplifting. But now, so many people refresh the screen on their phone to see if they've missed a call. It hasn't rung, but they're checking to see if they've missed a call. Is there a new text? I've got to do a tweet. What's Facebook? What's happening on Facebook? <laughs> While they sit at traffic lights, which is why people then toot, because they don't see the lights change. So it's, 
it's for it's constant unless we make a decision that we're not going to do that because it's all there on offer and we can take part or we can only take part sometimes rather than 24 7. Russian women tend to sleep too little and often they can't sleep restoratively most often they don't get deep sleep so I ask women when they wake up do you feel restored from your sleep it's supposed to do that and I, I know I see a bias group of the population but I'd say eight out of ten say no they're virtually just as tired when they wake up and it's not supposed to be that way they will often compromise sleep to get jobs done later at night interestingly another reason that women will stay up late they express to me frequently is to have some space, to have some time on their own because they're not able to have that solitude during the day. And I would probably suggest that that's probably good for their soul. Solitude is so important to our well-being. However, we do need our sleep as well. So we're forever balancing that, aren't we? We often spend no time in solitude, a rushing woman doesn't, and she feels there's no time for herself and she believes really that that's quite selfish or a luxury that she certainly doesn't have time for. They tend to be constantly irritable, or as my mother always used to say, oh, they're so gritty. And I had a lady recently, it's not just with, with big things, obvious things, I had a lady recently and she said to me, I knew I had to come and talk to you because the potholes in the road were just doing my head in. Every time she hit a pothole, she would feel so angry that her car was being all uncomfortable for her. Extraordinary. You overreact e easily, even if you don't display it outwardly. So you might cope with 80,000 million things during your day and then you get home and someone's left the butter out and you blow your stack over something that doesn't really matter. You laugh less than you used to. I can't tell you the number of people, both men and women, who say yes to that. You have a to-do list that is never ever all crossed off and this bothers you. You potentially have digestive system problems such as bloating or irritable bowel syndrome. Over 70% of women in the Western world have irritable bowel syndrome. You have a mental fuzziness or a brain fog that you only ever notice is there on a random day when it's not. People can't think clearly. It's a heavy, foggy head that they describe. They will often go to guilt as a common emotional pattern and they beat themselves up for not being a good enough partner, wife, mother or friend. If you live your life constantly saying that to yourself, whether it's consciously or subconsciously, it's very difficult to deliver and contribute to the world enormously. Of course you still are, but you live it from a place that you're just not good enough, that you're just not doing a good enough job. And that might be two centimetres or two kilometres from you feeling your absolute best and, and sharing your all. You feel anxious without your cell phone on you constantly. You can catch yourself constantly pushing the refresh button, thinking, what if I miss an important text or phone call? And you take your phone to the toilet for that reason. Rushing women will either lose their appetite totally or they'll feel so hungry that they could eat their arm off. The low appetite picture is because of the stress hormone adrenaline. Adrenaline is designed to save your life. Adrenaline communicates to every cell of your body that your life is in danger, literally. The trouble is that historically, our stress was physical. There, there was potentially a tiger about to come out of the jungle at us. But now our stress is far more psychological and often it's our perception of pressure and we're sitting at a desk while it's all building. So when we make adrenaline, normally we have a brilliant blood supply to our digestive system that fosters the, the breaking down, the digestion, absorption and utilisation of nutrients. But when you make adrenaline, we are designed to not focus on food. All the blood supply is diverted away from our digestive system to our periphery, to our arms or legs so we can fight the fight or run away. And in that moment, we are not designed to, if there is a tiger, if out of your peripheral vision you also see that there's an apple hanging on a tree and you remember that you haven't had lunch, you will be his lunch if you focus on that apple. So we are created as such a masterpiece to not actually focus on food when there's adrenaline coursing through our veins. So a lot of women actually lose their appetite. That doesn't mean they stop eating because a lot of people have a belief that they have to eat at a certain time of the day. So they still will eat, but digestion is often compromised, and that's one of, one of the many reasons that a bloated stomach can kick in, especially after lunch. You tend to take short, shallow breaths and often uh, become breathless. You might sigh frequently. You find it difficult to relax, particularly at night without wine. <laughs> Most people in the Western world these days warm up with caffeine and they cool down with alcohol. And I want to encourage people to find other ways to do that. 
Please always remember that it is what you do every day that impacts on your health. It's not what you do sometimes. So tonight is a perfect example. Tonight is a celebration. A celebration of you, your happiness, your souls, your eyes, your ears, your open hearts. So it's beautiful to come together and share amazing food with like-minded people, with people you want to learn from and grow with. So it's different. But if we did it every night, if we polished off two bottles of Chardonnay every night, that's a very different life from coming together and sharing those things with the people you love. So you can take the score, I actually, you can take the test, sorry, at rushingwomansyndrome.com. I actually, when I put the test together, I thought I've got to test it on my huge array of diverse friends. So I have friends in Australia in the health retreat industry that meditate twice a day, they would yoga five times a day, they eat in an extraordinary way and live very simply. And I also have very stressed corporate friends in Auckland and, so, and, and lots of people in between. And so I sent about 10 different women this test and it was so hilarious. My super, super, super stressed corporate friend in Auckland came back with a score of 78, <laughs> which is kind of off the Richter. But what fascinated me was that my yoga friends, they were getting about 12, between 12 and 18 and they were so worried. <laughs> that stressed them out getting because they thought they'd get zero or one or two. So it was very entertaining. And all that showed me is that these things really have become common, but it's not normal. But we feel like it is just normal now because of how we're living. So to help you really understand what on earth is driving this, it's important that you understand how the nervous system works. Your nervous system is your brain and your spinal column and then all the nerves that come off that wrap around all of your organs and drive their function. Your nerves go to the very tips of your finger, the very end of your toes. There are different parts of your nervous system, however. There's the central nervous system, which is under the control of your conscious mind. So I choose to wave my arms around, how loud I speak, what words I choose. I choose all of that and that's my central nervous system controlling that. Your autonomic nervous system, however, is controlled by your subconscious. And it can be tricky to explain this without sounding like a hippie. However, it drives, it makes your heart beat, it makes your hair grow, your fingernails grow. If you have a paper cut on your hand, you don't have to scream at it, heal, for it to do that. Your body has a wisdom and a driving force beyond your own mind. And every time I describe that, it blows me away. It's your autonomic nervous system driving that. And there are two branches to that part of the nervous system. You don't need to worry about the silly long words, but so you know them, it is the sympathetic nervous system, which is the fight, flight or freeze response. And the parasympathetic nervous system is your rest, digest and repair response. The majority of people at the moment are stuck in sympathetic nervous system dominance. Your adrenal glands that make adrenaline, they sit just on top of your kidneys, they were designed to work like a light switch, to switch on, churn out your stress hormones, get you out of danger, and then turn off. The trouble is that they switch on the minute you think of your to-do list, they switch on even further when you start to throw caffeine down your throat because caffeine makes your body make adrenaline and it holds you there, then you might juggle 80,000 things in your day. There might be deadlines, there might be 60,000 new emails in your inbox, whatever it looks like, and you stay in this space and you approach life with a perception that there's pressure. And that's key. However, not so long ago, our parasympathetic nervous system, the rest, digest and repair response, we were able to move very freely between them. And certainly, of course, people still can. But a rushing woman tends to be stuck in sympathetic nervous system dominance for a number of reasons. It's partly the choices she's making with her food and her diet. As I said, it's very difficult to say, be calm, be calm, be calm, when you've had six lattes over your day, because that, that's telling your body to do something completely different but it's also emotional because when we are born wired into the nervous system of every single human is the belief that we're not enough and that we won't be loved that is true for every human baby and it has to be because if no one loves us and no one feeds us we would literally die whereas other animals aren't that way they can survive on their own so we begin our life as what's called egocentric creatures. We believe that they're all there to meet our needs. 
and we grow up and that's beautiful and we're very blessed if we have people who will feed us and love us and take care of us. But that's hard, that belief that we're not enough and won't be loved is hardwired into us so that we will make an effort to get people to love us so that we can survive. As we grow, usually there is what I call a schism that happens with one or sometimes both parents, but usually there's one that goes first and hopefully only one ever. And what I mean by that is that it doesn't have to be big, bad, disastrous stuff, although it can be that. It can be a throwaway comment that hurts your feelings. One of the very first women I did this, work, did this sort of work with, she was very overweight. She was a superstar, absolute incredible woman. She'd made a lot of money. She'd set up these incredible charities. She was giving so much back to the world. And she came to see me and she said, sort me out, sweetheart. She was larger than life and that's literally how she said it. Sort me out, sweetheart. She said, I hear you approach this whole weight loss thing differently from other people. I can't work it out. I am a master in all these other areas of my life and I can't work this out. And to cut an incredibly long story short, she spoke about her mother with a vengeance that was very powerful. And it took me a couple of sessions before I even learnt that her mother had passed away 20 years ago. But she spoke about her as if she was always visiting her and she was always still around. What had happened is she'd fallen over when she was four years old and cut her eye. They lived on a farm and the mother came running out of the house and screamed, Jill, you should be more careful and then you wouldn't get hurt. In that moment, that child can create a meaning that my mother loves me so much, she's trying to warn me to be more careful and then I won't ever get hurt again. Another meaning that child can create is, yes, I got mum's attention. Another meaning might be that I've let my mother down. Another meaning might be is that my mother doesn't love me. She just, her tone of voice, she raised her voice, for example, or that I'm a complete failure because I fell and now I've got a cut eye. So that might be the first little instant of that a child might not understand what's gone on then. And then when they're seven, they might be about to walk out the door to school. And the mother might have 80,000 things on her to-do list that day. And so she says, oh, Jill, for goodness sake, it's freezing cold outside and you haven't got a jumper. Go to your bedroom and get a jumper before you go to school, for goodness sake. A child that creates a meaning that her mother loves her so much in that first instance does that again. There's no two thoughts. She just goes off to her bedroom, gets her jumper and goes off to school. But any of the other meanings that her mother doesn't love her gets fired off again in that instant. Ugh, she doesn't even think I can dress myself. She goes off to school and then forgets about it. But beliefs start to form that her mother doesn't love her. You can all hear in the way that I'm describing that, that her mother loves her very much. She doesn't want her to be cold. She doesn't want her to get hurt. We understand her intention when we describe it this way. But that child then grows up wearing glasses that she filters everything through that her mother doesn't love her. And so as an adult, that itch gets scratched on a daily basis to remind her of that belief because that reticular activating system is looking for evidence of it. She doesn't see the 80,000 examples of how that's actually not true. Does that make sense? So when you're sitting there and you're thinking, oh my gosh, I raised my voice at my children, don't go there. The reason that has to happen, this is the human journey. This, is, this happens to every single human and it has to because if we remain egocentric as we are when we are born, if we don't move into what's called an ethnocentric space, we have no reason to ever contribute to the world. And it's that itch that gets scratched that wakes us up that we have to be more than what we believe we are to contribute, to get love. And that is the driving force behind so many people's behaviour. And when you have challenging interactions with people that are driving your sympathetic nervous system dominance and holding you in that space, or it's your itch getting scratched and firing you off, if you can pause just for a second and ask the question, I wonder what's going on for them, before you let you, yourself go into your story, that can be a game changer. So can stopping at the traffic lights and looking at nature rather than keeping on texting and tweeting and things like that. So, actually, one more story about the, the nervous system. 
This is, this is extraordinary and it will help you see your body, I think, in a very different light. In any given moment, the human body is making a decision whether to use one of two fuel sources, glucose, or I could say sugar, or fat. That's it. They're the only fuel sources we use. We don't use protein. The body converts our proteins back into amino acids and back into glucose. So it's only fat or glucose, that's it, that we can use. And in, our, in the human body, because sugar is a fast-burning fuel, the minute we have it, we're utilising it. Because it's a fast-burning fuel, when, you, when your body believes that your life is literally in danger because that sympathetic nervous system is activated, what fuel, if it has to choose between fast-burning glucose and slow-burning fat, what's it going to choose? Glucose. glucose every time. And we have a fuel tank for glucose that's an average size human in science is considered to be 70 kilos. So these figures are based on that. An average size human has the capacity to store about two and a half thousand calories of glucose. We store it as glycogen in our liver and our muscles. But we have the capacity to store about 130,000 calories of fat. So yes, we'll die without water, but we can live for quite a while without food. And so because of those, store, those fuel tanks, the minute your sugar fuel tank gets below about 25% of maximum, your body is concerned that if there truly is a threat to your life, you won't have the fuel to get away. And so your desire for sugar is switched on because your body thinks it's doing you a favour. You've got to top that fuel tank up so that you can truly escape. Does that make sense? So what I find for people is when they're stuck in sympathetic nervous system dominance, if they're struggling, regardless of their body size, but they're struggling with utilising fat as a fuel source, because when you do use fat as a fuel source, you're like an ever-ready bunny, you can go forever. Your mood is very even, but also, so importantly, you don't make a lot of lactic acid and you don't make a lot of free radicals. And that is essentially how we age from the inside out. So using fat as a fuel is not just about how our clothes fit us. It has immense health benefits. One of the best ways in the universe to activate the parasympathetic nervous system is with restorative movement and meditation. With solitude, observing nature, feeling grateful. So any movement that gets you to focus on your breath will activate it. And what I find for the majority of people I come into contact today, they actually have to schedule it at first. Before it becomes a habit, they've actually got to book an appointment with themselves in their diary that they will meditate, that they will go to a restorative yoga class. And, then they, and you need to do it regularly, especially in the beginning, before your body starts to drive you there because you miss your day without it. That's what you want to happen.